We'll pick that up next week, and after the service, we're going to show this film. We showed it a week ago, but if you want to plan to stay and watch it, uh, it's called I Am Israel, and it's about six or seven people that live in modern Israel that just talk about what they're doing there and why God brought them back, and, and uh, it's a really wonderful story, very heartwarming, very it helps you to see. Uh, when you see the picture of acres and acres of vineyard that used to be just barren ground, and this man who, who moved there from Russia said, I, I, I wanted to start a vineyard. <clears throat> but he said, we actually had to drill into the soil to plant the vines because it was that hard. And then you see all these vines. And uh, anyway, there's a lot to it. I, I'll let you watch it if you want to, and it'll be good. Um, in the fall, we're going to have a Back to Church Sunday, the third Sunday of September. And then the week after that, we're going to start a, a series. And um, I'm going to invite people during the school year to read through the New Testament. It'd be about one or two chapters a day. And as we read through it, we'll have a group meeting to talk about what we're learning. If you want to join that, it'll be Sunday nights. And then on Sunday mornings, I'll be drawing my message from the passage that we read that week. And so um, you're welcome to do that. And then at 11 o'clock and hopefully at 9 as well, we're going to show that movie, The Chosen, uh, to folks who want to come early or stay after the service and, and see that and maybe be in a group as you watch it. You can get it on your phone. You can get it. There's several apps for it. But if you want to watch it in a group, uh, we've got a big screen TV and we'll be using that. And, I think it'll be very meaningful. I've watched it a couple times, and I just find it very, very meaningful. It points to Jesus. How could it not be good, right? <clears throat> a preacher was taking a shortcut home, and he walked through a cemetery, and uh, he heard some crying. And um, so he kind of looked around, and he spotted a man down on his knees in front of a grave. He was just bawling. He said, oh, I wish you hadn't died. If you were still here... My life would be so much better. I wish you were here. And so the pastor went over and put his hand on the man's shoulder, and he said, I'm sorry, sir. He said, has your wife been gone long? He said, oh, it's not my wife. It's her first husband. <laughs> I thought it was funny, too. But I kind of feel bad about laughing at it, you know? It's like, and, and the thing is that the, the time we live in, a marriage doesn't have a great reputation. People kind of are skeptical about it. Uh, some people wonder if they should even bother getting married or if they should stay married or, you know, what it's all about. And, and the truth is that um, it's important. Marriage is important. I'll show you some things in the Bible. But also, we hear things about marriage that it turns out aren't really true. Maybe you've heard this. I did. I thought, maybe, I thought it was true. It was said very convincingly. Half of all marriage ends in divorce. divorce. The pandemic was very hard on marriage. Uh, even people who go to church get divorced at the same rate as people who don't. All of those are urban myths. They're not true. And, and the person that told me that, that I believe, is named uh, Shanti Feldham. And Shanti's written several books that I found very helpful. And um, she was writing a, a, a newspaper article. She has a weekly column uh, in several newspapers. And so she was doing one, and she was talking about divorce. And she thought, well, I'll, I'll just double check. She's Harvard trained. She does research. She, she likes to be accurate. She needs to be accurate. And so she thought, I'll just take two minutes and double check this number on the divorce rate. And she checked a couple places to make sure, and they weren't the same. And so she said, what I thought would take me two minutes turned into eight years of research. She dug through all these things, the Census Bureau and different articles and different things, and she found facts, and she found opinions, and she found just basic misinformation that had no support anywhere, and so she, she tried to figure out what's actually going on in this area statistically, and she put together a book, and it's called The Good News About Marriage, 
And uh, so uh, I want to share with you some of the things that she found. First of all, the actual divorce rate in America has, uh, has never been anywhere close to 50%. Now, it has reached 50% for certain high-risk groups, like teenage marriage. You know, if you get two 17-year-olds getting married, the odds of them staying together are a lot lower than when they're older. And so there have been times in certain groups, but overall, no, never close. And then the vast majority of married people, she says, number two, are happy. That shouldn't be a surprise, but you do, sometimes you hear so much you wonder. But people like being married. They like their partner. They, they're happy together. The vast majority will say that. Number three, the rate of divorce is significantly lower for those who go to church together. Now, she found out where that other idea came from. It was a fellow named George Barna who does a lot of survey work, uh, and uh, he's very reliable. But he said, Shanti, what I actually found out was people who say that they're believers have the same divorce rate as people who don't say they're believers. But I found out that if they went to church together, it was like 28% lower. See, it's not just what, what you talk, it's how you walk. And couples that worship together are much more likely to have an enduring marriage. By the way, that significant, I found out what that means. You need to have a significant other. If you look at the word carefully, it says, sign if I can't. <laughs> so if you're thinking about marriage, make sure they have good credit so they can sign if you can't. Number four, the large majority of remarriages survive and thrive. I also heard second marriages have a higher divorce rate. She says that's not true at all. The vast majority do well, even third. The most marriages, marriage issues can be resolved. She says they've, people who get counseling, people who get some help, they can get through almost anything, including infidelity. They're, their marriages have survived just about everything you can think of, but it, it takes a commitment and sometimes it takes help. You know, when I need help physically, I go to a doctor. When I need help legally, I go to an attorney. And when we need help in our marriage, sometimes we need to go to somebody who has some insight on that. And so uh, it does make a difference. Number five, uh, four, five, six now, the divorce rate has been going down for decades. It's still falling. It's still fun. There's reasons for it. Frankly, one of them is people didn't get married to begin with, so they didn't have a divorce. But there's positive reasons, too. There's, there's a lot of positive in this. It's not, uh, not being cynical. Number seven, the longer people are married, the less likely they are to divorce. People who get gray hair uh, figure things out in, as they go through life, and they, they make up their minds. We're, we've made it work this far. We're going to keep making it work. And a marriage uh, lasts longer when it has been going for a while. And so the, the idea of a gray-haired divorce is, is not, it happens, you've probably heard of it, but it's not a, a major thing. And then the last one, stress, often makes marriages stronger. They ask people, how did your marriage do during COVID? How did your marriage do in, depre in a de financial depression? And people over and over said it made us stronger, made our family stronger. And so those are the things that she learned. Now let's talk a little bit about what the Bible says about marriage. First of all, marriage, God's idea. You open the Bible on page one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It goes on to describe that in chapters one and two, how God created everything. We believe that we're not here by chance. We're here by design. And those chapters spell that out. You get to chapter 3, and already in chapter 3, I'm on page 3 of this old book, and it says on that page, husband and wife. Marriage was part of God's plan from the very beginning. He created male and female to spend life together. He designed us. He designed marriage 
to bring order, to bring a belonging, to bring blessing into human life. And the Bible tells us that marriage is something all of us should treasure. Um, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by everyone. Not everyone needs to be married. Not everyone is meant to be married. Not everyone chooses to be married. That's um, part of life. God has room for all sorts of variety. But there's a general plan that you would spend your life married to one person. God's plan has been a man and a woman for life. That's what marriage is in the book that he wrote. And so marriage should be honored by all. We should respect a marriage. We should encourage marriages. We should support marriages. But um, we're not all necessarily married. And, and there's reasons why during life you may find yourself unmarried after you've been married. But some people consider marriage unimportant. It's just a piece of paper. You've heard that. The Bible says it's God's plan. It's God's design. And so when we diss it, we're really saying to God, you don't know what you're talking about. But he does. He does. So marriage is important to God. He invented it. And sometimes people want to change marriage and make it whatever I want it to be. Well, I'm married to three people. Well, you know, one guy said he wanted to marry his pet. Well, you can't just change marriage um, when it was God's idea. And then um, sometimes it's ridiculed, it's discouraged, it's laughed at, it's disrespected. But God says it matters. So let me give you five things God says about marriage. God gave us marriage to meet our deep human need to belong. I still remember in college reading a book by an anthropologist, and it talked about the universal human needs. And we know what they are. You need to eat. You need shelter. You need, um, you need a, most people need sex. You need different things. But one of the ones that I didn't see coming, and it's because I'm a guy and I'm not very bright, he said everybody has a deep-seated need to belong. And it's as real as hunger. And it makes sense, doesn't it? And anywhere you go in history, anywhere you go in the world, you'll find people live in groups. They live in villages. They live in clans. They live in cities. We need to belong. A gang is a place to belong. And so there's that human need to belong. And God wanted to meet that need in various ways. But one of the most satisfying ways is through marriage. You have a partner. And we have, uh, we have folks in this room who've w woken up next to their best friend for 50, 60, 70 years. 70 years waking up next to my best friend. That's a gift and an achievement, isn't it? And it, God designed it that way, that you would belong, that you would have a place. And so he gave us that. It, you know maybe this verse, when God created uh, the world, he created Adam last, almost last, and then God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. For one thing, what's he going to do when he opens the fridge and he can't find the mayonnaise? <laughs> what's he going to do? He's going to run up a terrible electric bill, among other things. And all he needs is someone to come and say, honey, it's right here in the door where it always is. I'm just talking about our house. I'm not... But seriously, there was something in Adam that needed companionship. There was something, in fact, the translation of that verse can also be, I will make a helper suitable for him. And the word in the Hebrew that it was written in, the word for helper, is used often in the Bible, in the Hebrew part of the Bible. And in almost every other place, when it doesn't refer to the wife, it refers to God. God is my helper. Okay, what kind of helper is he? You know, honey, get me a Coke while you're up? No, it's give me guidance, give me wisdom, give me direction in my life. The woman's role is very important in a man's life. And God said, it's not good for him to be alone. I made him to need someone to be there for him. And I made her to need him. So uh, that's the important thing about being 
belonging. Marriage gives us a place. Now, he arranged a lot of things for, for us to have companionship, friends, cousins, neighbors, co-workers. There's all kinds of ways people can be part of our life. Uh, some of you maybe have had friends since your childhood or teenage years. There, there's no replacing of those old friendships. And uh, God gives us many gifts of companionship. But marriage is a unique one. It's a special one, and it's a sacred one. And so here's one more verse about that. When God made the world, Jesus is speaking here. When God made the world, he made them male and female. So a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. So the people are not two, but one. God has joined the two people together, so no one should separate them. God shows up at every wedding. Sometimes he has to crash, but he wasn't invited, but he comes. He does. Every culture, every religion, every wedding, God joins them, that man and that woman when they make that commitment. It, that, I believe that. I don't, can't tell you exactly, but what it says here, what God has joined together, makes me think that. And so he says, if God puts people together, don't you mess with that. Don't you interfere with that. Don't you discourage that. You help to make that work. And uh, he invented humanity, and then he invented marriage. The same day that he made Eve, he made marriage. And it's not a human idea that we can ignore. It's not a human idea that we can just decide what we want to do with it. It's not something we can try for a while and toss it aside. It's, an, uh, uh, it's something God ordained. And it's meant to be solid. It's meant to be permanent, just like our commitment to God. Number two, God gave us marriage to become people of strong character. When you marry somebody, your relationship with that partner is going to have a profi profound impact on the kind of person you become. It, it's going to make you better or worse, and it's meant to make you better. We learn to be unselfish when we get married. You know, some people have had the idea historically that the way to get really close to God, be a really holy person, is to get off by yourself, live in a monastery or, or be a nun and, and live somewhere where you just don't mess with anything that is worldly. You just, it's you and God, you know. But I believe that, uh, that it's easier to live a disciplined life there than it is with a marriage partner and maybe a couple of little kids. You want to learn about patience? Get married. Have a baby. Try to make it on an income that isn't quite where you, you need it to be. You're going to learn a lot about patience there and a lot of other character qualities. Marriage is meant to be a place where we grow up, where we become less selfish. You have a thousand chances a day to be less selfish, more giving and more loving. And so marriage is meant to be a place where we mature. The Bible says love is not self-seeking. And in marriage, we're reminded of that over and over. I need a bass boat. Well, not till I get a vacuum cleaner. And so there it is. Here's what the Bible says. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others certainly begins at home, doesn't it? Maybe it begins with sharing the sheets, the blankets, I don't know. When someone says they're getting married, what do people say? Hey, look, I'm getting married. I hope you'll be happy. I hope you'll be happy. It's a nice thing to say. It's a generous, courteous thing to say. And we do. In fact, God hopes you'll be happy. Why would he, why would he make you to be unhappy? He didn't make us to be spoiled brats, but he did make us to find satisfaction in life. And so when people get married, we, we want them to be happy. We want them to make each other happy. But God has a higher goal in life than us taking our temperature and saying, how happy am I today? God has a goal for us to, to be something, to be what he made us to be, to have character, to have uh, love, to have generosity to be worth hanging around with and so marriage is a place where us to learn that to be better people marriage makes us 
more like Jesus if we let him work in us. Third, God gave us marriage to build families. Everybody in the world gets here through sex. God thought of it. People say, well, man, I don't want to follow God. I'll miss out. God thought of it. Any, anything you find pleasant in life, God thought of it. Look, this God of ours, he made us so we need to eat. We need to fuel up every day. I went to the fair with that express purpose a couple times. <laughs> and, and so how did God make it? So it was hard work? I personally, let me stand behind here for a minute. <laughs> I personally find it very pleasant to eat. And one of the reasons is God made how many thousands of kinds of food? How many thousands of ways are there to eat? How many ways can you eat a potato? And then, right here, he put 10,000 taste buds in your mouth. 10,000. Is he holding out on us, or is he generous? Is he a strict, mean body, or is he generous and giving? Is he loving? Does he delight in us? He's a good, good God. He is a good, good God. And he made us to enjoy life. And that includes that whole area of sex. But here's the thing. God intended sex to bring about children, among other things, and he intended the children to be born into a family. Here's the scripture, one of them. God made husbands and wives to become one body and one spirit, for his purpose. This is so they would have children who are true to God. So be careful. Do not break your promise with the wife you married. God intended for children to be born through sex, and he intended for that to happen in a home, in a family, within a marriage, and for those children to grow up knowing this is where I came from. I came from this man and from this woman, and they love me, and they guide me, they protect me and they teach me. And the best thing a child can have is a stable family, a mom and a dad, the best foundation he can have. And, uh, and he'll be more useful in society because of the stability that is built into his house, into his life. You know, I, I wasn't born disciplined, but I did get disciplined. And after I got disciplined from outside, I learned to discipline myself on the inside. And I'm not perfect yet, I'm not near that, but my mom and dad taught me some things that I needed to internalize, and I was more ready to receive it from them because they loved me. The Bible says those who obey and respect the Lord have a secure fortress for their children. Their children have a place of refuge and security. It's a gift when a husband and wife stay together and raise their family. And all the studies in social, you know, all those studies they do, it comes back to that. You know, the, the biggest problem, I, I just listened to something from Wendell Qualms. Uh, he's up in Minneapolis. He's a, he's a black man. He loves the Lord. He works to, to improve uh, the community. And he says the problem we have in Minneapolis is not a racial problem. It's a parent problem. It's a home problem. He says 80% of the black kids growing up in Minneapolis come from a one-parent home, and sometimes neither parent. He says that's why there's trouble in the school. That's why there's trouble in other areas. It, they haven't had that rooted grounding that they're meant to have. And so marriage is God's way of building families. The world isn't perfect, and we're not perfect. I'm a divorced man. My kids would tell you I did a lot of things wrong, but we, we need that structure to get the best of what we can have, and we need to aim for the ideal even if sometimes we fall short. We need to come back to the plan. We do. And, and here's two things. First of all, no child is an accident to God. God loves every child. The, the situation of a child's birth does not change God's attitude 
or care for that child. God loves every kid, wherever he came from, however he's growing up. God loves children. And this church has always had a ministry to kids because kids matter to God. This Bible school we're doing this week, the things we'll do in the fall, they're for everybody. God does not discriminate against a child because of something somebody else did, ever. Number two, every couple doesn't have children, even those who want to. And I don't know, the, I don't know how to say why. I can just tell you this, God cares. God gives grace. God weeps with those who weep. And he, it matters to him. It does. And he shows us what to do when our hearts are broken. And so we talk about the ideal, we talk about the biblical uh, principles, but we understand that we're all fallen and broken people and the world we live in is, but God is still active and he's still caring and he doesn't throw anybody away. Number four, God gave us marriage to benefit all of human life. Societies thrive when marriages are valued. The Bible says marriage should be honored by everyone. We saw that. Not everyone needs to be married, but everyone should honor marriage. Everyone should care about people's marriages. It's the best foundation for a healthy community, for a healthy state and nation. Our schools, our businesses, our government, our military, they're all stronger when people are there who are committed to families. If I go to work and I get mad about something, I just feel like quitting, if I have a family, I say, well, let me just slow down a minute before I just stomp out of here. I'm just a more stable person when I care about a family. And that includes your parents. One of the things I respected about my dad is that sometimes the phone would ring when he got home from work, and he'd talk a few minutes, and he'd say to my mom, I have to go to mom and dad's. Uh, their plumbing isn't working. My dad was their plumber. He was their electrician. He took care of them. They had come from Denmark, and... Uh, and they needed help on things. He put plumbing in their house when he came back from World War II. He cared about his parents. And, and, and that somehow reinforced the fact that I knew he cared about me. So any, when we're talking about marriage, we're talking about all these relationships that God gives us that we need to invest because God makes things better. And he was a better man because he had a family, including the one he was born into. The Bible says, doing what is right makes a nation great, but sin will bring disgrace on any people. America is stronger when marriages are strong. Number five, God gave us marriage to bear witness to our relationship with Christ. The best illustration God could think of in human life for how he relates to us is when he, he talked about marriage. We're the bride of Christ, the Bible says. He cherishes us. He meets our needs, and we honor him. And it's what God says about marriage that matters. Here's what it says in Ephesians. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, he died so that he could give the church to himself as a bride in all her beauty. When he's talking about the church, the Bible never once uses the word church to refer to a building not talking about a place. It's people. It's believers. It's followers of Jesus. That's what the word church means. It, it's the people called together. And what he says here is, husbands, if you have a wife, love her the way Jesus loves us, sacrificially. He gave himself. What, how did he give himself? He went to the cross. He paid the penalty for sin. He paid the penalty for every sin. He didn't have a little list and say, well, that one's too bad, that one's, too, oh no, not touching that. No, every sin, anything you can think of, Jesus died so it could be forgiven. Every person who would ever live, he died so that they could know God, be in his family. And he comes to a man and he says, now I, I paid a price to, to give you what you needed. I want you to do that for your wife. One fellow told I was dating a girl, and he said, you know, honey, I love you so much, I'd die for you. She said, oh, you say that, but you never do it. <laughs> I 
He said, well, I have an undying love. <laughs> well, Jesus did it, didn't he? And many a man has done it. Many a man has done it for the people he loves. He didn't stop and think. He didn't ask himself, how do I feel? He did what had to be done, and if it cost his life, it was a willing gift. Jesus says to a husband, you love her that way and watch her thrive. You love her that way and watch her blossom into the woman I made her to be. And none of us does it well enough, but that's what we need to be aiming for. And he talks some more. He says, in the same way, husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. And that is what Christ does for his church, the body, his body. The scripture says a man is united with his wife and the two become one body. This is a profound mystery. He says this is really not just, I'm not just talking about marriage. He says I am talking about Christ and the church. Somehow if we can understand how much God loves us, how he's invested in us, it'll show us what marriage is meant to be. And then he concludes it. So each husband must love his wife as he loves himself and each wife must respect her husband. Earlier in the passage, he talked about a wife submitting to her husband. Oh, that's all loaded. I know. Here's what, the, here's what I tell a couple that are getting married. This thing about submitting to your husband is not if he says, let's go to McDonald's and you feel like going. That's not submitting. It's when you don't feel like it. When, when you really don't want to, that's when you need to remember this verse. And husband, when you really don't want to sacrifice, you really don't want to give her the last brownie or let her hold the remote, that's when you're sacrificing. That's when you're being like Jesus. I'm joking a lot, but it's, uh, it's God saying, give yourself. And he only commands us to do things when we need to be reminded it still needs to be done because we don't feel like it. He says, do it anyway. And his design is to make a marriage rich and strong as people give. And when you give at home, you're much more giving and generous and caring to others. It makes you a better person all the way around. The world is a better place Every time a man and a woman come together in the name of Jesus to build the union he wants them to have. The whole world's better. That's why we celebrate marriages as communities and as churches. It's good for us all. And since it's God's idea, we can count on him to show us how to do it. He's the one who thought of it. He can show us how it is meant to work. And he does. When he joins two people together, he brings his grace to help them do it. Daily Bread years ago had this little line. It takes two to make a marriage, but it takes three to make it work. And there's a passage in the book of Ecclesiastes about a three-stranded cord. It's hard to break. And, and it's talking about two are better than one, and then all of a sudden it says, but three are better. Who's the third? It's God. We need him. He'll make it work. He'll show us how to be what he called us to be. I want you to look at this picture. He's 85 years old. She's got to be pretty much the same. Somebody saw them walking, stopped and said, why are you holding her hand? He said, she doesn't know where we're going. <laughs> Does she get scared? He, and then he added, she has Alzheimer's. Does she get scared if you let go? No, she doesn't know who I am. She hasn't recognized me for years. But you still take her for a walk every day? He said, of course. She doesn't know who I am, but I know who she is. She is the love of my life. Isn't that the kind of thing God thinks of? Wouldn't that be the kind of plan he would have? Isn't that what we want in life? Wouldn't you want to be either one of them? To have someone that committed or someone that trusting? 
And listen, uh, you, maybe you're saying, I don't know why I came today, I'm not married. Take a look at that woman and ask yourself, who else could that be? Could that be a Down syndrome child? Could that be a younger man and his mother or sister? There, God wants us to be givers. He wants us to love. He wants us to invest. He wants us to be faithful. He wants us to be available. He wants us to give ourselves so that people will benefit and we will grow up and we will become like Christ and we will fit into his eternal kingdom. We don't earn our way to heaven. It's a gift. Jesus gives it to us. We can't earn it. We're not good enough. But he wants to make us kingdom people and marriage is one of the ways. Any relationship you have is another way. Marriage is special. Back to their day, and their friends enjoyed it with them. But they, they've come to really give their lives to Christ. They've come to want to follow Jesus with all their hearts. They've been coming to our church. They've, been, uh, they've become members. But most of all, they prayed to Jesus. Lord Jesus, will you save me? Will you make me your child? Will you forgive my sins and show me how to live in God's plan? They became believers. They became followers of Jesus. And they said, you know, Pastor, we got married, and it, it counts, and we're, we're honoring it. And we, you know, even though nobody was probably thinking much about God, he was there, and they know that. But they wanted to get married in a church. They wanted it to be about God. And so I'm going to ask Clarence to come up and stand with me here. And uh, Bonnie and the others are going to come down the aisle and we're going to renew their vows. We're going to re-consecrate their marriage. This won't make them more married. It won't make them somehow a better in God's eyes, but it will make them better people in the sense that they are not only being married for each other, they're saying today, our marriage is for Jesus. And so now we're making it all about him in a really special way. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. We're not playing wedding today. We're, we're doing something very significant. We're, they're renewing their vows. They're making a sacred promise all over again to each other and to God. I want to invite you, if you're here with your partner, to maybe hold hands during this part and uh, to make it a, a, a personal renewal for yourself. I'm going to stand down here. Clarence and Bonnie, the vows that you're about to make are not how you'll always feel. You're not saying what you'll feel. You're 
saying what you'll consistently do. This is a commitment God wants you to make, and he'll give you the grace and the strength to fulfill it. May the Lord always keep you close to him and to one another. And Clarence, if you'll look at Bonnie, and the one whose hand you now hold is giving you her most precious treasure, her love and trust. Bonnie is ready to go through life with you and share the future's joys and blessings, as well as its responsibilities and burdens. Her happiness and welfare depend on your character and conduct. Do you, Clarence, promise that you will love Bonnie and honor her and forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto her for as long as you both shall live? Would you repeat this promise? I, Clarence, take you, Bonnie, I, Clarence, take you, Bonnie to be my lawful wedded wife, lawful wedded wife to, have to, hold, to have and to hold from this day forward, this day forward for, better for, worse, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, for or poorer in sickness and in health, and health to love and to cherish, to love and cherish till death do us part, do us part according to God's holy law. I promise from my heart. And Bonnie, the one whose hand you now hold is giving you his heart, his devotion, and his trust. Clarence wants to spend his life with you, and he's ready to share the future with you in both its positive and its demanding terms. His happiness and welfare depend on your character and conduct. Do you, Bonnie, promise that you will love Clarence and honor him? And forsaking all others, keep yourself only unto him for as long as you both shall live? Would you repeat this promise? I, Bonnie, take you, Clarence, to be my lawful wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part, according to God's holy law. I promise from my heart. And now as you exchange rings, these rings are going to be a reminder to you and a testimony to all others of the commitment that you're making to one another. May they also indicate God's unending presence in your lives and in your marriage. Clarence, as you slip the ring on Bonnie's finger, would you repeat this? Before God and these witnesses, Before God and these witnesses I give myself to you, and I give you this ring as a token of my love and a promise of my faithfulness. And Bonnie, as you put the ring on Clarence's finger, would you also repeat this promise? Before God and these witnesses, I give myself to you, and I give you this ring as a token of my love and a promise of my faithfulness. Since Clarence and Bonnie have consented together in holy matrimony and have pledged themselves to one another before us and in the sight of God, I pronounce that they are husband and wife, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Let none separate what God has joined together. Amen. Okay.
Well, thanks for being part of this. I got here about 8 this morning, and when I came up to the building, I...